So here I'd like to talk a little bit um, about uh, the hardware. Uh, I am not uh, in the humanities, but in the humanities I always have to start with the Greeks. And uh, actually, I don't speak Greek, let alone ancient Greek, but I've you know done my homework and looked it up. Uh, so, so Plato, uh, well, who argued all kinds of things, but he also argued that uh, we have an inner fire that we are emanating through our eyes, and this inner fire is then interacting with objects. Uh, then uh, there was Epicure, who was believing that uh, tiny replicas of the object of interest are transmitted via our eyes into our mind. Uh, Ga Galen thought that we are emitting rays which are interacting and then coming back. Um, that was not so far off the mark. So actually we don't emit rays, but uh, there are many active vision systems. So for example, uh, what is this Microsoft thing called, which you can put on top of your display, Microsoft Connect? Anybody owns one here? You're really not the nerdy kind here. So I, I don't earn one, but you know uh, I'm, I'm totally unrespectable in my own group. And, uh, everyone seems to have this sort of stuff. So anyway, there is this system, um, and, and you can gesture to you know skateboard or whatever. And uh, this thing is actually emitting rays, and that makes it a bit easier to understand the geometry of what's going on uh, in the room in, in front of this uh, playing console. So uh, one could build such active vision systems. Uh, and then there was Al-Hazen, uh, an Arab uh, scholar uh, living around a thousand uh, after Christ. And he postulated, uh, no doubt after having sliced up a few uh, animals, um, that the eye is acting as a camera obscura, so, so uh, as a pinhole camera. And I would expect that he earned all kinds of derision when he postulated that, because that would mean that on our, and, and that's a fact, that on our retina, the world is projected upside down, which is happening. Huh? So we, we have a, essentially a poor quality camera here, and the images are projected onto the retina upside down, and yet all of us perceive the up as being up and the down as being down. And to stick with this postulate in spite of this very counterintuitive evidence, I think must have taken some guts. So uh, I have some admiration <laughs> for this uh, for this guy. And and it is very counterintuitive that we don't you know see the world upside down even though it is on uh, on our retina. Yeah. Um, so I think somewhere I have it picture um, of, uh, let me see, somewhere I have a picture of what's going on uh, there. So broadly speaking, um, up there are our sensors and the eye as a, the optic quality of the eye as such is not very good. You know, the sensors are, we argue, are actually pretty good. Um, but then uh, we have a lot of post-processing. And it is this post-processing uh, which is the really interesting stuff. Uh, by the way, and this is what this picture is uh, meant to show, uh, the eye or the information here from the right hemisphere is processed uh, in the left back of your head and everything from the left hemisphere projects uh, to the right uh, visual cortex. And uh, all of the early research into vision uh, was based on patients. So people with uh, all kinds of interesting lesions, lesion is a polite word for uh, in injuries, in this case, to the head. And there is, for example, this phenomenon, this phenomenon of blind sight, where the eye works uh, perfectly normal, and uh, people, but but it's it's a damage here, for example, at the back of your head, uh, which prevents people from seeing. Yeah, so so let's say somebody hits you with a well, 
somebody got hit here, eyes are fine, <laughs> and uh, yet uh, the person cannot see. Uh, there are even more extreme cases, um, like certain deficits in perception, where people see well enough, for example, faces to describe these faces in minute detail, you know, how are the nostrils, what color are the eyebrows, and such and such, but they even so cannot recognize the people, even if it's their, their own kin, for example. And so this clearly has to do with uh, some of this higher level processing. But even the eye is not uh, perfectly understood. There are, for example, some people arguing that uh, diffraction plays a role, whereas others say, uh, no, it doesn't. No? But anyway, here's, here's the eye. Uh, we have uh, a low quality uh, lens as compared to what you have in your cameras. On the other hand, the advantage is that it's adjustable while you're not too old, um, which is why we have these muscles around there, which can deform uh, the lens. And uh, well, then the image is projected here to the retina. Uh, we will talk a lot about uh, the fovea today, uh, the gelbe fleck in German. Um, this is uh, where we have most acute vision. Um, and, or did I mistranslate? Does anyone know what the, it's correct? Okay. Uh, because I, I wanted to make sure I don't mix it up with the optic disc. Uh, I don't know what that is called in German. Uh, this is, anyway, this is where all the wiring exits the retina. This is where all the nerves, fibers exit the retina. And uh, interestingly, here we have no photoreceptors. So this definitely is a blind spot. And yet none of you perceive it. So when you look around this room, you always imagine that you see everything, even when you have one eye closed. Um, but in actual fact, there is this hole. And, and you have these experiments where you know you have to put your nose at 10 centimeters from this leaf of uh, the sheet of paper, and then uh, a suitably placed dot will disappear. And so this means we normally interpolate. By the way, we also have the impression that we see everything with the same level of detail, which is also wrong. It's, uh, you know, let's say I, I have the impression that I see everything quite sharply here. And uh, as a proof, when I look there, you know, I see it perfectly sharp. <laughs> you know, this is self-verifying prophecy. So in actual fact, um, we see most acutely here in the fovea and we have a much coarser uh, uh, vision around. More about that later. Uh, in evolutionary terms, in vertebrates, the eye is an extension of the brain. So uh, this is called an optic stalk. Uh, stalk, as in, uh, in in German, this would be Stiel. Yeah, you know, Stielauge, this is a stalk eye. So what happens is that the brain emanates something that is going to become an eye. And I find that quite fascinating. Yeah. So, so the eye is quite literally an extension of our brain. Uh, it hasn't worked like that in all animals. So in uh, octopuses, for example, who also have quite formidable eyes, um, a part of the skin is recruited to form an eye. And then this eye builds connections to the brain. Yeah? But for us, it works uh, the other way around. And well, I find it amazing. Uh, so <laughs> here we have the optic stalk, which says, hey, I'm going to make an eye. And then the skin here knows that it's, it has to provide a lens. So this, um, the skin here folds into something, which then uh, disconnects, and that, that is the future lens. So in evolutionary terms, uh, well, and, and actually in all of us, this is how our, how our, how our eyes were built. And if we look at the retina in a bit more detail. You all have heard about rods and cones. Um, these rods are more elongated and uh, they have a better uh, photo efficiency. So these rods supposedly are single photon detectors. And uh, we have a picture here. Now this is a, a zoom up on a, on a rod 
and you see this uh, membrane which is folded onto itself again and again on the right hand side. Um, this is a membrane uh, that is uh, completely well packed full with rhodopsin photoreceptors. And they are so heavily stacked such that when a photon comes uh, and uh, well, the, the, it is a task of the lens by ray optics uh, to, to make sure that uh, uh, it's going to traverse this rod uh, along its uh, long axis to maximize the chances that this photon will interact with one of the photoreceptors and uh, eventually fire a stimulus. And there are experiments that say that a rod can lead to a signal even when there was really just a single photon coming in. This is not quite true for the cones, which, however, offer us color vision, why, uh, which is why we have a red and a green and a blue uh, cone here. Um, so we have of the order of 120 million rods and uh, perhaps uh, 7 million cones. Um, let me just uh, write down these numbers somewhere. So let's say we're here looking at the hardware. Um, and by the way, um, my main instrument here will be, I will always write on the board and I hopefully eventually learn to read my writing. Uh, it helps that, you know, I'm, I'm speaking while I write so you can, to train you. And, and I will, <laughs> I will also, uh, you know, I'm still practicing with this pen so it will become better over time. And if it's too bad, then, you know, just remind me that I should try harder. Already at elementary school, I had a terrible mark in Schönschrift. Yeah, so it's, a, <laughs> it's been for a reason. Uh, Anyway, um, and now, you know, I'm not going to in, ask you in the exam how, how many rods and cones do we have, um, but there will be part of the lecture when it gets more into math and so on where you, I think, where you will or you should want to copy. And my theory is that um, this helps you learn. And I have good evidence that that is actually true. Um, you know, maybe some of our intelligence sits in our wrist, no, but, but more seriously, if you've written an integral three times, there are greater chances that you remember it actively than if you've just, you know, seen it displayed on slides, uh, so on and so forth. So anyway, um, for the retina, we have uh, of the order of 120 million rods, and we have of the order of 7 million cones. These rods have very high photosensitivity Uh, cones have a lower photosensitivity, um, but these are monochrome, and these offer us color vision. And in fact, we have uh, around uh, two-third red cones, around one-third green cones, where by red and green cones, I mean that their photoreceptors have somewhat uh, different absorption profiles. And how about the blue? Uh, around 2% uh, only of, uh, of blue cones. And that is amazing. So, so because in, you know, to us, it seems like we can see red and green and blue equally well. But if we look at the hardware, where we should see blue much less uh, than the other colors. So it seems like there is some extra amplification in our blue channel somewhere. And there is something interesting in, in blue vision, namely, uh, this is something that's been driving me nuts and I finally learned uh, why that is. Uh, if you travel to Austria, um, they have a bank, of which I'm not receiving any royalties, uh, who are having this symbol here. And if you look at this uh, at night, like on a picture like this, 
so on this picture, which was taken by camera, obviously, um, the symbol here is perfectly crisp. But if you look at it uh, by eye, or at least by my eye, it's completely blurred. And, you know, I, I can see the, the building right next to it, perfectly sharp and crisp and everything, but the blue here is blurred. Can you explain? Exactly. Yeah, so we have optical aberration. Uh, the, uh, the refractive index of our lens is uh, uh, wavelength dependent and uh, blue gets uh, projected not quite where it should with respect to the rest. Um, this is one reason. And the other reason is that actually um, these, so these rods, they are mostly in the fovea, but within the fovea, as the title of the slide says, um, the distribution of the blue is not as, it sh as you would expect it. It's more on the periphery of uh, the fovea. Anyway, when you get to Austria, you know, have a look at this and re remember. Okay, um, here's what I've been mentioning already, that, um, so this reads angular, so how many angles are we away from the fovea? And here's the respective density of rods and cones. We see two things. We have uh, practically all our cones in the fovea. And uh, if you look at the rods, their density is not uniform, but, but it also decays uh, as we move away from the fovea. So really our vision here on the periphery is actually a lot worse than uh, than we usually think it is. Now, even so, these 120 million receptors, I think that's not bad. So, uh, you know, a consumer camera nowadays has maybe 10 million pixels, and of course this number is changing, but 120 million is not bad. It's also not bad compared to other animals. So I, I, I used to think, for example, that cats would also be pretty good. You know, they need it at night, uh, but they only have around 20 million receptors. And uh, the eagle has 280. Okay, he's got to be better at something. Um, but it's not really the number of receptors that matters. It's the post-processing that makes uh, the difference. And I have a picture somewhere of uh, their uh, respective eye and brain sizes. So uh, carp, top left, or frogs, top right. I hope we agree they have pretty eyes, <laughs> frogs in particular. But you know, don't, <laughs> don't go kiss it because <laughs> they have very little brains, as you, as you see here. Whereas, you know, look at us here, the real prince. Huh? So, uh, and, uh, well, another reason, uh, you know, an experiment each of us can do is that I can take a really low resolution image or movie and uh, still understand what's going on, even though uh, it has this low resolution. And again, uh, I have an example, which I acquired yesterday when I went uh, cycling with my kid and you know really low resolution it's an old camera ah did you see the frog <laughs> so i wanted to show <laughs> i wanted to show two things um first is you can still see what's going on even though this is really low resolution second is the importance of motion detection where's the frog there <laughs> anyway if, if i asked you where's the frog you know, if you just said in the middle of the image, it would be good prior because humans take to uh, put the object of their <laughs> of interest in, in the middle. But beyond that, it's motion detection is really, really important for our survival in evolutionary terms because it helped you eat and it prevented you from being eaten. Uh, and uh, well, I, I like those well camouflaged animals because this is a typical example you really only see them when they move. Okay, 
Um, I jumped over, no, I jumped over a uh, few hardware slides. There. Um, here are examples of what uh, such photoreceptors look like. And here you see the absorption profiles. So when we say red and green and blue, uh, it wouldn't be very useful if they had a perfect peak, because if, if they did have a perfect, perfectly peaked absorption profile, we would only see light that has exactly the right wavelength and uh, none of the remainder. Um, so it makes sense for them to be spread out. And you see that especially red and green are actually pretty similar. Now, not everyone sees like we do. For example, the European starling has not three, but four distinct colors. And the guy at the bottom here, he's, uh, as far as we know today, uh, the world record holder uh, by having 12 distinct uh, colors that, uh, that he and she can see. So uh, uh, we imitate that in our expensive satellites. Um, where we do spectral imaging. We don't just acquire uh, a red and a green and a blue image, but uh, dozens or hundreds of spectral channels. But uh, by and large, when we take images that are meant for um, human consumption, we just acquire and display three channels, simply because we only have these uh, three distinct receptors. And the this picture here shows some of the colors that are used. Um, so no matter if I have a TFT screen with light emitting, you know, I would have three types of light emitting diodes on there. Or uh, if I, uh, this is an older image for cathode ray tubes, uh, you would take three distinct colors and well with three points you can span a triangle. Um, but this is a human perception diagram. There are actually colors outside this triangle. And so, so there is a good reason why things look better if we look at them in real life rather than if we just look at an image. And uh, this famous horseshoe here has been built based on human perceptions. So uh, humans were shown distinct colors and asked how close together they are spatially. And if you had a laser which you could tune from 380 all the way to 700 uh, nanometers wavelength, then uh, out here is in perceptual terms what you would see. So this would just be a single wavelength. Now, every spectrum you can combine by, well, taking multiple of these peaks together and weighting them. And so whatever spectrum we see um, will be somewhere in this convex region, will be somewhere in between. And, uh, well, often it will be within this triangle or within this gamut and sometimes it will be outside. And uh, I have a example of a typical thing that's outside. Uh, you know, th these here, they these markers, they never, on a screen like this, they never look like they do in, in real life when you use them. So this is a typical example of uh, things that are outside this uh, triangle that you can span with the three kinds of colors that are conventionally used. Okay, so we have um, three colors, which is why um, typically we store images in the RGB format. So each image would have three planes and we store for each pixel how much red and how much green and how much blue is in there. And if we switch all pixels on, or you can, you can actually, uh, if, you, if you, well, nowadays you can do this experiment yourself conveniently. If you go to Bauhaus, um, they have these uh, lights for inside. 
and then you have a remote control and you can say I want cozy red light or I want blue light or, or I want green light and it's uh, and, and you see that you know these are distinct diodes but when you switch all of them on it looks like white and this is of course the same principle uh, how this projector is working or how this screen here is working so if we switch all on we have white if we switch all off we have black if we switch just one on, we get pure blue or green or red, and then we have all these mixed colors. Now, while this is technologically convenient, uh, it is not very close to our human color perception, and a number of other color spaces have been uh, propose, proposed, um, such as uh, the CAB space or here um, the HSV space. When I was typing HSV to get this image, I first got all the images from the football club. Um, but, but what it here means is um, hue, saturation, and value. So hue uh, is what we would usually call color in colloquial language. Um, then in this cylindrical coordinate system, we also have saturation. So in the middle, it's white. On the outside, it's pure color. And we have value, which goes from black to bright colors. And you can easily transform between these spaces. Here's what what you do in printing. This example here is uh, from a Heidelberger Druckmaschine machine, of course. Um, so here we have uh, subtractive mixing. Uh, the primary colors are uh, uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, and in principle, you could create black by mixing cyan and magenta and yellow. But if you have a printer at home, or if you buy a machine like this, this is not how you produce black for two reasons. Um, the less important one is that you wouldn't get, in actual fact, you wouldn't get quite black, but something like a, an ugly brown that's very close to black. And the more important reason is that this is a very, very expensive way of creating black. And this is why um, such machines and also your uh, printers at home have an extra black channel, which is the K in CMYK. Okay, um, a few last uh, comments for the brain, uh, namely, in uh, evolutionary terms, vision is pretty young. So if I ask you to uh, picture a strawberry, no, you uh, manage no problems. If I ask you to imagine the smell of a strawberry, that's for most of us a much harder task. And uh, broadly speaking, the reason is that uh, scent and smell, and also touch of course, in evolutionary terms are older. So what puts us apart from animals is uh, our our big cortex which came very late in evolutionary terms so the cortex see there are some parts of the brain uh, where our uh, visceral feelings sit uh, that is quite old and uh, regulation of uh, heartbeat and such functions, all of this is old. And then this huge thing here, the, the neocortex, that is what really puts us apart from the animals. And uh, well, so animals can see also, I know, um, but uh, if you compare higher and lower animals, um, it is, uh, well, what, what really matters is how big this part is. And uh, vision is somehow more closely coupled to this newer part of the brain than uh, smell and, uh, and uh, taste, which are coupled to older parts of the brain, which is why we cannot uh, imagine these other stimuli quite as well. Okay, I simply state as a fact that, uh, broadly speaking, here in the brain, we 
understand what is going on, whereas in that part of the brain up here, we understand where things are or how things are happening. Again, this has been understood mostly through uh, lesion studies where uh, people with uh, interesting quote-unquote uh, injuries uh, were evaluated. So in general, I will always make a break after 45 minutes. Uh, I will also do so now. After the break, I want to uh, tell you a little more about how our visual pathways work and then come to a first. Okay. So I had uh, two kinds of questions in the break. Uh, one was more about neuroanatomy and they were beyond me. Uh, my favorite book in the area is this one. Uh, and I actually read it, but it's been a while. So uh, I cannot, I unfortunately could not reply to the detailed anatomical question. Uh, the other question was about uh, how this wiring, or, or in general, how, how these experiments on the brain are performed. And there, there is a whole battery of uh, techniques. Um, so historically, very important was uh, the patch clamp for which uh, Heidelberg researcher Ben Zuckman uh, got his Nobel Prize uh, that allows you to study um, the action of individual neurons. Um, a further development of that are tetrodes, so those are arrays of uh, electrodes which you can put into the brain um, of animals, but it's also even done on humans because there are some people who, are, who suffer very severely from epilepsy uh, to the extent that uh, even drugs don't work for them. And the only thing that does work when they have a seizure is to stimulate this uh, their brain uh, electrically. And this is what these uh, arrays are used for. Uh, but uh, the researchers implanting them are uh, also happy to record signals when the patient is doing well. Um, then there is uh, electroencephalography, a non-invasive technique where you put lots of patches on the head. Um, there is uh, magnetoencephalography where you uh, record the very minute changes in the magnetic field of the brain. That is of necessity a very expensive technique and one that will never be widespread, uh, not least because you need uh, 10 or more centimeters of lead shielding for your room in order to get rid of the outer, you know, the earth magnetic field and the tram driving by and, and all this, it's very expensive. Um, but these EEGs, uh, there are even now companies that are selling you these uh, hats with EEG sensors in them. Uh, this, I think the most serious use case is for paraplectics, so, so people who cannot move their limbs any, any longer and would like to communicate. And this is a fairly uh, efficient means when you, trans, when you train the computer connected uh, to these sensors uh, to steer a cursor or, or such things. Um, there is fMRI, so functional magnetic resonance imaging. And that's actually starting to be a bit scary, I think. Uh, and I want to quote one particularly interesting experiment which worked as follows. Um, the researchers would take a volunteer and would show this volunteer uh, random movies from YouTube, uh, all the whilst recording their brain activity via fMRI. And so the researchers had the ground truth. They knew what image a, a proband was shown at that very moment, and they knew what the brain activity signature looked like. And they did that for many hours and uh, afterwards uh, showed other movies, recorded the brain activity, and from this brain activity reconstructed what the person was looking at at that moment. And the reconstruction is, I would say, scaringly good. You know, it's not yet perfect, but, but you could clearly see, you know, a person being on that side doing this sort of thing and so on. And uh, so this is ultimately going in the direction of reading people's thoughts. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that in, in several ways, you know, opens new, uh, well, doors, let's say, in a neutral, uh, in a neutral way. 
so this is functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is also non-invasive. Uh, then important for this area is diffusion tensor imaging, where you measure the local diffusivity. And it so happens that in uh, uh, neural tracts or fibers, the diffusion has a preferential direction, namely along the structure of interest. And now from measuring these diffusion tensors, you can try and solve the inverse problem and see where these fibers are going and ultimately what is connected to what else. And that is a promising technique and then also there's good quantitative research being done on that. And then finally, another invasive technique is all this uh, volume electron microscopic imaging um, that, you've, uh, that I've shown you a movie of uh, at the very beginning of the last hour. And uh, final technique that I want to mention is uh, calcium imaging, where you can quite literally watch neurons firing. So you can either uh, genetically modify, um, let's say, a mouse, or you can inject this mouse with a particular virus. Uh, the effect of uh, is in both cases the same, namely, a firing neuron lights up in the in the it has a fluorescence signal, and so that allows you to directly look at the surface of the brain and see the neurons firing. Uh, in real time, all the while uh, offering uh, visual or auditory and so on stimuli. So that has also opened massive new possibilities to better understand what's, what's going on in the brain. Now I have a couple of pictures. Um, organization of the visual cortex, anno 1975. Uh, here's a, another picture, uh, anno 2000, and uh, you know, in 2013, you can be sure it's much more complicated. But what people agree on are that there are different visual pathways. And the people afraid of creepy crawly creatures should look the other way now, because I'm, I'm showing you one, uh, just because I have a nice excuse here uh, to show one there. Um, this is a spider, and it has. Uh, uh, so this is one possible hardware realization of such different visual pathways. It has its main eyes, and it has these side eyes. Uh, in this particular kind of spider, these auxiliary eyes are the motion detectors, so they are for feeding. Whereas these principal eyes, they scan the environment for things that look like legs. Things with legs are something that you can mate. So <laughs> this uh, spider here has one visual channel for mating and another visual channel for detecting prey. And uh, here's a uh, uh, sketch from another no Nobel Prize winner, Eric Kandel, uh, of what this looks like in uh, vertebrates. And you can see that broadly um, there are here, uh, there, there are um, different uh, pathways, one for color, one for motion, one for uh, perception of stereo. But altogether, the picture of how all these things work is still pretty sketchy. So where does this leave us, uh, human versus computer? Uh, I, I tried to make this picture where on the left-hand side, I put things where the computers are good at, you know, historically, it started with just uh, manipulating numbers. Uh, it then took quite a while until uh, the best human chess player could be beat. And we are now reaching the stage where I would argue the computer is becoming the better driver. Uh, you know, not that humans couldn't do it better if they wanted. The problem is that humans don't want to sometimes. And, and uh, you know, you see here uh, a little bit uh, a screen. Uh, this is an experimental vehicle. But what's really built into current cars is uh, that they look at traffic signs and they tell you if you know that you're going too fast, or they recognize pedestrians before you are going to crash into them. And there are different ways of dealing with such knowledge. Uh, one that 
seems to be uh, socially acceptable is to uh, prime the brake. So, so if there is a problem, the car may alert you and it may pump up the pressure in the brake such that even if you touch the brake very lightly, you will decelerate strongly. Um, there are also, in principle, you could ha have the car brake by itself, but that uh, brings many problems, uh, mostly of a legislative nature. So if the car brake wrongly and somebody crashed from behind into the car, then who's going to pay for this and, then, and, and so on. And uh, on the right hand side, well, is a, uh, is a, let's say a complex scene. And in general, in such scenes with great variability, uh, computers are still not doing great, in particular when the distinctions that have to be made are of a subtle kind. So much research goes into scene understanding to, to understand, for example, if uh, you know somebody is about to be uh, robbed by a gang or something. And for us humans, it's typically easy to make out if these are just uh, teenagers uh, you know, pretending to fight or if this is something serious. And a distinction like that is very, very hard uh, to make for a computer. So in general, where you have uh, high reproducibility and little variability, this is where computers excel. And the more complicated or the more variable things get, uh, the harder it is for a computer to match human performance. I here try to uh, you know, give you an intuition for this. So if I asked you um, which images are more similar to each other, then, well, I would guess most of you say, uh, you know, the where I, where I show the five, those are more similar, and where the hand is about to be clinched to a fist, that is more different. But if I simply uh, compute Euclidean distance between the images, and that's the first thing that you do in pattern recognition, you compute the distance between things, then, uh, and if I turn these distances into positions, then those are the positions. So actually, the two images on the left are much more similar to each other by Euclidean distance than the image on the right. Can someone offer an explanation? Yeah? The one on the right is slightly brighter. The hand by itself or the second? The whole image is brighter. Um, it's not true. The whole image is about the same, but it's going in the right direction. Exactly. The right image has been translated. So let's look at the difference vectors or the difference images. And you see that between the left images, the, dis the difference is relatively subtle. You know, it's uh, whether these fingers are uh, here uh, extended or not. Whereas, uh, let's say, between the image on the right and the image on the top left, it's the uh, um, here the arm that has shifted and that causes a big difference in uh, intensity values. And if I just take a clear distance, this uh, shifting of the arm and the resulting difference in gray values largely outweighs the signal that is perceptually meaningful to us, namely uh, how many fingers are there. Okay. Um, yes. So the uh, I have to take all these numbers here and square them and add them up to get a single number, which is Euclidean distance. And I've used these single numbers to create this embedding. And this image here, I just wanted to, uh, by showing the difference image, I want to motivate why the one number is larger than the other number. Or ask again, please. OK. The distance is a single number. I've just broken it down into pixel contributions. Make sense? OK. Good. So uh, we are much better than computers in uh, understanding uh, scenes. But we have to understand, so on a very, on an abstract level, on a philosophical level, 
um, the input that we get from our eyes is very strongly underdetermined. So an example I like is, you know, where I stand, if I, you know, I have a table in front of myself, and in principle, I don't know if under the table there's not a hole gaping, you know, to the garage of this building and into the core of the earth, and perhaps I see the, see the stars on the other side of the earth. But no, that's not what I'm thinking, you know, and, and also in my mind, uh, I don't run around with question marks. So wherever there's occlusion, like behind this table, uh, I don't usually assume, you know, there could be a monster under each uh, one of these occlusions. Um, I just have a, a model for the world. So, so in this case, my world model says that you know, probably the floor is continuous and probably Torm is not only a head, but you know, a, a body also, and, and so on. Um, so we are all using such a world model. And uh, most of us, um, this is helping us in construct an, uh, a mental picture of what is around us um, from this uh, input, which strictly speaking uh, would not suffice to uh, infer everything that we do infer from it. Now, here's a place to talk about optical illusions because uh, sometimes this can lead us astray. I have a couple of pretty pictures. This one you will know. We have these uh, dots dancing around, even, you know. Even though I assure you it's just a static image, there's nothing going on here. Um, these lines are, in, the long lines are in fact parallel, but we perceive them as strongly skewed. And you know, you know this one, everything's moving about. Uh, I assure you again, it's a static image. It works for cats also, by the way. I've seen a nice YouTube <laughs> movie of that. <laughs> uh, YouTube is great. <laughs> um, and. Here's one more. Let me show you the website for this. Uh, so these are um, these are just dots, right? N remember, these are just dots, and now these dots are just um, oscillating a little bit around their uh, equilibrium position. There is not a human walking here. <laughs> it's, okay, it's just dots that are oscillating. And, and if, you, if you want to play with this, it's a nice website. You know, you can you can turn these dots into female, <laughs> or you can turn them into male, and uh, you can make this male uh, nervous, or you can make this male excuse me, you can male make this male relaxed, and and so on. Okay, good. And and by the way, the technique behind these dots and so on. How all these motion models are created. This is actually it's as trivial as it gets. This is a principal component analysis. This is something that we will talk about uh, in more detail later in the semester. So uh, I want to close this part with a quote uh, from this very good book by Palmer, who says that perception is not a clear window onto reality, but an actively constructed model of our environment.